Good afternoon and good morning. My name is Nigel Schweitzer and welcome to the Cypher Patent Informatics webinar on measuring the accuracy of AI for classifying patents. What's the gold standard? I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Steve Harris, CTO of Cypher and the co-founder. Uh, but uh, even more exciting is to have Tony Trippi with us, Managing Director of Patent Informatics. Tony has been working in the field of patents for more, more, more years than he would care to own up to, but is also the adjunct professor of IP management and markets at Illinois Institute of Technology, and has had a, a whole string of accolades to his name, including being the person who wrote the paper on the preparation of patent landscape reports for the World Intellectual Property Organizations. It's also an interesting stat for those people who like numbers, and I hope many of you on the call do, that both Tony and Steve are members of the IAM 300, which if you count me, Nigel Schweitzer, into that group as well, that's 1% of the world's patent strategists, if you believe statistics. But before we go on, Tony, I wonder whether you could just introduce why you've had such a passion for patent analytics, uh, right through to developing a company and coining the term patent informatics. Hey, Nigel, uh, Steve, it's a real pleasure to be here with both of you. A uh, big fan of Astemos and the work that you do, not just with the software, but in supporting the community, uh, all of the work that you're doing on transparency and authorship and assigneeship, and, and this uh, work that we're doing here with the development of gold standards. Uh, you're really, uh, uh, you've supported the community overall to a tremendous degree, and it should be uh, acknowledged and, and uh, I, for one, am very appreciative of all the work that you've done. But, but um, you know, I began my, my career as a patent information professional, uh, otherwise perhaps known as a searcher or a finder, as uh, it's more affectionately referred to these days. And it became very clear to me that uh, there was more to be done. There was more value that could be extracted uh, other than just providing um, references and as, it, as critical as that is, especially with regards to the legal function, when it comes to the business function, uh, references and, and, and looking at individual patents is, is essential, of course, but there are deeper insights that can be gleaned from looking at uh, patents in aggregate, uh, patents in collections of 500, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. And so uh, while patent analytics has been around uh, since at least the mid 60s, uh, there's been a resurgence of it in the last uh, 20 years, and, and certainly nowadays, I think most patent information professionals would say that uh, they absolutely need to have some analytics chops uh, in order to provide maximum value to their clients. Thank you, Tony. And Steve, before we get on to the presentation, I just want to wish you happy patent day. I was looking at my diary uh, earlier on, and it's almost seven years to the day uh, when you first met patent and patent data what was going through your mind when you uh, decided to get into the field and what was your background before that um so i've, I've been working in the ai space for about 25 years initially as an academic and then um, and then in startups um the the patent world was kind of fascinating as a, a new and exciting challenge um you know, looking at the world and what was available um, to professionals in the industry, it was clear that it was a bit underserved by high-tech solutions. And it just coincided perfectly with some major advances in sort of both speed and efficiency, but also the cost effectiveness of AI, which meant that we could plausibly bring these solutions to this community. Um. We're in for a pretty lively session, I think. If the, the blog that Tony started and the advertising that was put around on LinkedIn, this is my favorite quote, quote from Matthew, I hope, I hope has actually signed in today. If an AI search tool worked well, we wouldn't need it. We'd automatically classify every patent and converge on a single source of truth. I also wouldn't laugh when I got the results. Clearly, AI has had a, a lot of discussion, and in particular, we'll be talking today about uh, machine uh, learning. That's where a field that uh, Cypher focuses on. It's the area we wrote this paper uh, together with Tony uh, earlier on in the year, published in the World Patent Information. Uh, it is a scientific paper. It's not necessarily the easiest of read for, for patent professionals. It was written as much from a data science perspective. But what we'd like to go and do today is explain why we believe the paper was so important 
and to give some real context uh, for, uh, for, for, for what it actually stands for. Important to go and say what we'll not be covering on today's webinar, which is the enormous and valuable work in the field of AI more generally. So you can see on the slide a, a sort of picture of a, a typical uh, patent life cycle from the invention process to examining it for freedom to operate and novelty to helping the patent offices do examination more efficiently right through to exploitation and where necessary invalidation. And I put on the slide and the slides will be made available as well. Some of the recent publications, the last one which came across my desk was uh, only earlier this month, but was published in April, which was the work of the UK Patent Office around AI assisted patent and prior art searching. Uh, we're not talking about AI. I say we're talking about machine learning and a very specific branch of that and uh, no better person to take us on that journey than Steve. Yeah, so this is um, kind of a summary of the what drew me into the patent world and why it seemed like a good idea. Um, as I said, you know, my previous company was in the anti-fraud space. We were using much less sophisticated technology and it costs easily 10 times as much to, to subscribe to it as a solution, but it was a uh, uh, a knottier problem with a, with a higher a higher ticket price to solve it, so it was appropriate to throw that much technology at it. And now it's come down to the level where it can be applied to other industries where the budgets aren't quite as big. Um, so, as Nigel said, really we're talking as much about ML and AI as AI in, in this particular talk. So. Um, <laughs> It's a little bit complicated. AI is kind of as much uh, an idea as it is an actual scientific field. Uh, this picture is probably quite controversial, but I've worked in both non-ML and ML AI, and this is kind of how I would characterize it. Um, and the intersection of where ML algorithms are typically described as being AI is what's called deep learning, which is yet another buzzword which is really just a degree of complexity of ML like above a certain level, which is poorly defined. We describe it as being deep learning. Um, and it's really all about the capabilities. Uh, there's nothing you can do in, uh, in a deep learning system, which you can't also attempt in an ML system. It's just the results are typically a lot better in deep learning. Um, and all of the use cases that Nigel described previously around FTO searching and whatever, or fall into one of these categories. But the focus here is really about classification um, and, um, uh, but, but the, the other topics in there are all, are all relevant, uh, relevant areas of application of AI and ML technologies. They're just much harder to measure. So first thing to say is, Classification is, as a sort of a system that's delivered to end users, is as much about the human process as it is about the machine process. So this is a demonstration of what the what the flow looks like of building a classifier on behalf of a client. You've got on the left there, the, the client specifies what it is they're looking for. They describe the scope of the technology they're interested in. Then, um, a person who's skilled in, in ML technologies trains the ML to identify exactly that topic. Um, and then the output of that is a classifier, which is then moved into a sort of production phase where it can be applied. Um, it can be applied as often as it likes. And once it's moved into production, it doesn't change. You can then go back and retrain it and push a new version out, but um it's kind of a fixed thing that's versioned you say right i'm going to release this and then that's the version that's used um clearly you can't measure the accuracy of people uh, it's just not possible so when we talk about all these metrics for how accurate um ai and ml systems are it's the software that we're measuring and to a limited extent the data but we're not really measuring the human component of that um Patent data is specifically challenging because there's lots of gray areas. I mean, anyone that on this call that's familiar with patent data will know that it's very common to have um, patents which talk about some topic, 
but they also talk about some other topics and maybe they relate to the thing you're interested in and maybe they don't. So often the decision about whether the patent is something that you're looking for is they're down to subtleties of the use case or the particular person's interest in this technology or whether it has some other aspects which make it relevant. Um, and because of the, the way that classifiers are trained, there's this upfront investment of time in order to um, in order to train the ML. There are applications that make sense and applications that don't. So typical applications where you wouldn't want to use a classifier, but you could use other ML technologies, are things like FTO searching on prior art, where you're only looking for a very small number of patents. And you're probably only going to do that search three or four times and then you'll never come back to it. Whereas on the other hand, if we look at things like landscaping, strategic data analysis, asset tagging, or analyzing portfolios, those are things where you need it to be repeatable, you need to do it over and over again, and you're probably going to analyze many technologies simultaneously. And that's where the investment in classification makes much more sense. Um, so there's a number of um, popular misconceptions about what AI and ML can and can't do. The, um, the media is unfortunately responsible for a, a lot of these. Um, the first one to say is that AI does not teach itself. It has to be explicitly taught everything that it's going to identify, not necessarily a specific um, instance, but it has to be given an example to everything it knows. And it doesn't learn by being used unless it's being explicitly corrected and retrained. Um, it doesn't, AI is quite a confusing term. It doesn't look at the world in the same way that a human does. The, the term AI is used because the results are human-like, not because the way it goes about it is anything like how a human does it. Um, when, when the ML algorithms are processing pattern data, they're looking at enormous strings of numbers, like hundreds of thousands of numbers. They're not looking at the text. They're not looking at the diagrams. They're looking at um, they're looking at a numerical representation of that data, which is quite different from what a human would do. And um, but despite the fact that the results seem quite human-like in their accuracy, you do see some differences. So the AI can often spot very subtle patterns in the data, which a human would never spot, but also they'll do things which are incredibly dumb due to the lack of world context. So when, when you create a, an ML algorithm for identifying patterns relating to LIDAR sensors, when, it's, when it comes into existence, it doesn't know anything at all about the world, whereas a human expert already knows an awful lot about technologies surrounding LIDAR and other things that might be confused with it whereas the, the ML just doesn't have that context. Um, but because of the things that we can see people doing with ML in some cases everyday life, some cases the near future, like interpreting spoken instructions like Siri, translating text, diagnosing illnesses, or in the more extreme case, self-driving cars, it's quite easy to anthropomorphize AI and imagine that it's somehow intelligent in a way that we would understand, but really it's just a huge amount of mathematics. And uh, now I'm gonna hand over to Tony to talk about gold standards. Thank you, Steve. So one of the things that we decided to do uh, in this space is, is develop some standards. Uh, on, on one of Steve's earlier slides, there was some discussion about data. And, and data is essential to each and every one of these, uh, the use of these algorithms, the use of these techniques, uh, that's, that's what you use to train or to teach uh, the system about what is correct and, and what is not correct. Uh, and so I wanted to begin, and I'm not gonna read off these slides uh, per se, uh, I just wanted to begin with a couple of definitions because there's a little bit, there's two terms that get tossed around uh, and, and they're generally more or less semi-synonymous with one another, but it is worth talking about uh, the difference. Um, one is a gold standard, uh, which is what we're calling what we're doing, and, and it's referred to here from Wikipedia, 
diagnostic test or, or a benchmark. That's a, the best available under reasonable conditions. Okay. So, and in other words, it's, it's the most accurate test possible uh, under the current environment. All right. And, and so uh, next slide. Um, that is contrasted against uh, a ground truth. And the ground truth is, is what's probably used most frequently in the community. So when you're talking to uh, data scientists, when you're talking about talking with people who, who uh, uh, have a, um, a computer science background or talking about machine learning uh, at an academic level, they'll refer to uh, these items as a, a ground truth. And this, uh, as you can see in the parentheses again, is refers to the accuracy of the training sets classification for supervised learning methods. And, and so that the idea of this, this ground truth is, is that, uh, that it, it's, it's basically almost without error. And so you can see that down there at the very bottom, the, the term ground truth refers to the absolute state of information, while the gold standard strives to represent the ground truth as closely as possible. All right, so ground truth is an absolute. Meanwhile, the gold standard, and especially since it's being put together by a human being, and human beings aren't any less infallible necessarily than some of the best machines, but the gold standard reflects the idea that this is not absolute truth. Next slide. So how did we build these? And so again, looking a little bit into the relationship here, uh, Astemos, Steve, the, the, the scientists that work at, at uh, Astemos, uh, design all of the, the algorithms, design all the systems, uh, put together all these mathematical models. Uh, they're responsible for, for creating the classifier. And what they asked me to do is as a patent information professional, they asked me to build a collection. And this collection could be used for both training uh, and for evaluation purposes. And the importance of having these gold standards and then quite frankly, giving them away, is that these provide people who want to uh, use these types of systems as a means of, of being able to compare systems to one another, train systems to do specific types of work, and to, to just generally have an idea based on, a, 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 uh, on, a, based on a, a standard that was put together without biases, uh, to, to then create a collection. And so, I just mentioned here that it was built uh, a variety of different ways using traditional uh, patent information retrieval methods, keywords and Boolean logic, classification codes, uh, citations. Okay, next slide. Now, there are some desirable characteristics, just so nobody thinks that this is straightforward or simple. There is some rhyme to building these collections in a standardized way that are gonna be fit for purpose. And so let's talk very briefly about those. Now here again, there's a set of slides that go through the specific examples with the quantum computing system. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on on these three slides. I'm going to spend more time on the next three slides after that. Uh, but you have to have a scope. So you have to be clear about what's a reasonable level of agreement. Uh, you have to have um, uh, the actual agreement itself. Uh, you have to have a diversity of technology. Uh, in this case, we've got two collections currently. One is on quantum computing, uh, qubit generation for quantum computing, and the other one is on cannabinoid edibles. So you can't probably imagine two things that are more different than one another. Uh, the size of the data set is also important. If you have too few, it's not really useful. If you have too many, uh, things become uh, a little muddier and it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to work with. Next slide. And then you've got these ideas of, of how challenging is it? And this is actually my favorite part to talk about uh, because I, I thought I came up with some clever analogies about how to uh, talk about uh, how challenging something is. And then of course it needs to be independent, can be no uh, systemic biases, uh, such as for instance, the preponderance of a small number of class codes. So if you build these collections in a specific way, well then you're biasing the set. Uh, and then and biases are never a good thing when you're talking about a machine learning system. You know, and finally there's, there's identification. And you know, what's written here is you know, one of the more trivial uh, though persistent problems in patent data is the lack of standardization. Uh, and so uh, the gold standard uh, has a standard of identification uh, that, that uses formats that are widely used and understood. Again, that because you can then go ahead and use them broadly uh, across a variety of different tools uh, and with different systems. Next slide, please. 
All right, so now that we've got sort of the, the, the uh, criteria out of the way, we can talk about a specific example. Next slide. So in this case, what we're talking about, uh, th again, there were two uh, qubit generation for quantum computing and cannabinoid edibles. And the scope, specifically for say, the quantum computing, the qubit generation, specific enough to be useful, large enough to be practical. And it can be used to identify or evaluate against other aspects of quantum computing. And we'll get more into the challenge part uh, to, to talk about it, exactly what that means. Next is agreement. Um, the initial two uh, collections were validated by a single person. Um, ideally, we would have two or three people uh, looking into these and coming to a consensus between those people. Uh, the specific scope for the uh, current gold standards, I'm not going to read these. I already mentioned one's for qubit generation for quantum computers. The second is on uh, cannabinoid edibles, and there's some uh, items there to talk about. Uh, cannabinoid isn't just THC. Uh, it isn't just CBD. Uh, it refers to a variety of different uh, cannabis-type products. Edibles could be lozenges, beverages, powders, confections, um, oral absorption, essentially. And then we talk about um, these each come with a uh, a collection where um, the negatives are ones that are easier or harder, uh, where the easier negatives are ones that um, are more far afield and the harder negatives are, are negative uh, references that are a little closer to, to what somebody might expect. Next slide. So again, the diversity of technology is readily apparent <clears throat> in, in uh, quantum computing and qubit. This would be coming primarily from the G and H sections of the International Patent Classification System, while the cannabinoid edibles are coming primarily from A61 and A23. So again, no over dependence on, on IPC codes, but very much so uh, a diversity within them. Uh, and and you know, we're looking at them at a very high level. <clears throat> and in this particular case, the size of the data set, there's 500 positives, at least 500 negatives, uh, in the examples that I put together, the, there were actually a thousand negatives uh, that I initially divided into easier versus harder. So 500 of each one, 500 easier and 500 harder. And so you'll find 1500 references uh, in these collections. Next slide. Now, this is the part I like. How similar should positives and negatives be? All right, you can think about a continuum here. And so if you use this clever analogy, comparing apples to astronauts, well, come on, <laughs> that's not a challenge. Anybody, anything can figure out the difference between an apple and an or and an astronaut. But then at the next level, apples and fish. Okay, you eat them both, but there's a pretty big difference between the characteristics between an apple and a fish. Next, you've got apples and oranges. Okay, now this is a little like Goldilocks as well. You know, the, the apples and astronaut is too big. Well, the Fuji and the red delicious apples, that's likely too hard because they're both apples and they share almost identical characteristics. That one's too small. The apples and oranges though, that in the Goldilocks analogy, well, that's just right. Uh, and so that's, that's what we're looking for here is, is somewhere along this continuum where it's not too easy, but it's also uh, not impossible to actually distinguish things. Next slide, please. Okay. So getting back to our, our, our six criteria challenge, we want apples versus oranges as opposed to apples versus astronauts. Uh, independent, it is independent, uses all available search methods, including Boolean, classification, codes, keywords, citations. And it, 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 I've taken advantage of everything I possibly could uh, and looked at each one of the records individually to verify uh, that one is, yes, indeed, having to do with qubit generation. And these other ones may have something to do with quantum computing generally, but uh, aren't talking about qubit generation. Some of them might be about software. That's a little further afield. That would be uh, the easier to distinguish, a qubit generation versus quantum software. And then some are a little closer. It, it might, might be uh, a piece of machinery that's associated with a quantum computer, but it's not being used to generate qubits, just to give you an idea of, of what sort of continuum there was. And then identification. Um, there are Impidoc family members included uh, for all of the positives in the collection. And this allows for uh, making certain that 
there's no discrepancies with regards to uh, family members, regardless of, of what sort of system and, and what sort of um, uh, scope as far as country coverage is concerned is being used by the person uh, using it for evaluation. Next slide. Okay, uh, we've put, everybody's gonna get these slides. Like we said, these are available for anybody to download. They're on GitHub. And so there you go. They're both collections can be found at that URL. Next slide. Now, trying to keep to time as much as possible here, because we want to make sure there's plenty of opportunity for questions. Um, this is all about community support. It, it, Asimos, again, should be congratulated for starting this effort. Uh, they worked with me to, to, to create the first two collections. Uh, but obviously, if we're going to do this for real, there needs to be more collections. Uh, and there needs to be more people involved. And so ideally, it would be nice to have seven to nine different diverse collections that cover uh, individually each of the, the major IPC uh, classes, for instance. And then again, it would be great if we had other people um, that were actually, uh, you know, two people looking at a collection, looking, you know, if both agree, it's in. If both don't agree, then it's discussed. And, you know, all those sorts of things to make sure that we get our own human curated portion uh, to as high a precision as possible. And of course, um, there are a number of other vendors, number of other companies that work in this space, and it would be f fantastic, really tremendous, uh, to get more people involved, uh, not only in using the sets, but to helping develop them. Next slide. Okay, so here I wanna pass back to Steve. Um, we obviously want to help the community understand ML. We also wanted to gain trust that Cypher was a, an efficient and effective algorithm for classifying. Steve, do you just want to talk through how we went about that part of the process? Sure. Um, so this is a visualization of part of a gold standard. So when you're evaluating an, an ML algorithm against the gold standard, uh, to sort of cut a long story short, you effectively slice the gold standard in half, keeping some positives and some negatives. You train it on on half of it or some portion of it, and you evaluate against evaluate against the other half. So this is a visualization of the part that's being evaluated. So in this in this example, there's 300 patents, 97 of which are positive. So they're examples of the uh, qubit generation technology, and 203 are negatives. So those are examples of related technologies, but not actually qubit generation. Um, we then take that um, test portion of the data, we ask the classifier to give its predictions over, um, over whether they're positive or negative, and then we look to see how that compares with what the gold standard says. So in this case, this is a completely hypothetical example, but the, the classifier has identified 96 things which it believes are positive, three of them weren't, and it's identified 204 things which it believes are negative, Four of them weren't. And then we calculate um, the key metrics, which are precision and recall. So there's actually a dozen or so different metrics we use for different use cases, but the, the, the by far and away the most useful ones are precision and recall. And they're calculated by um, uh, just some calculations on the number of patterns that fall into the, the various characteristics. So true positives are the ones which have been identified as positive and are, uh, false positives, one that we identified as positives and aren't, and so on and so forth. And we do these numbers, just do this straightforward calculation, and that gives you these numbers between zero and one, which are the precision and recall characteristics. Um, these can then be combined into a single number called F1, but we're not really worried so much about that. That really exists to as a way to settle arguments between computer scientists about whose algorithms better. Um, the, if we can go on to the next slide. So that all seems straightforward, right? Um, but unfortunately, there's a number of gotchas which aren't really obvious if you read a sort of layman's guide to measuring precision and recall. Um, to give some idea of how difficult it is to do it for real, Tony constructed one gold standard on the, the um, quantum computing one, and I tested it against one uh, one algorithm. And that was worthy of publication in a peer-reviewed journal. It's really very, very difficult. In computer science, we've been doing this analysis for 40 years, and it's still 
regarded as a monumental amount of effort to do it properly. Um, it was weeks of effort and uh, really, really quite difficult. As an example of um, why it's so hard to do correctly, um, imagine you've got some labeled data in your business already where you've, you've got two different people to go through and analyze um, uh, some patterns. You're interested in understanding what the topic was. And the agreement between the two people, they didn't overlap, they just, they just did like 100 each. And the agreement between two people was about 70%, which is typical, probably a bit high. You'd be surprised how often pattern experts disagree about the topic of a pattern. Um, in that scenario, if you try and test an algorithm against that, the maximum possible precision you can see is 0.85. And in reality, you'll just never get that because of the confusion in the underlying data of it being done by more than one person or even on more than one day or more than one database, you'll, in reality, you'll just confuse the ML algorithm and it will, it will never get to, to that level of uh, agreement. Um, there's also one thing that's really important to say is there's no such thing of, of absolute precision and recall. Precision and recall only means something against a specific test. And those test results do not extrapolate to the real world. They are, it's a way of isolating the algorithm and saying, under this very, very controlled, um, controlled condition, how does it behave? Um, so having said all that and all the, all the issues and how hard it is to interpret, why bother? <laughs> and and what, what actually is a useful test, but really, um, the key thing, if you're thinking of deploying ML algorithms inside your organization is, does this do something useful for me? Like, you can stare at amazing precision and recall numbers all day, but they won't tell you that it's actually useful, uh, or equivalently, you might have some numbers which are, which are relatively low, but for certain use cases, they might still deliver value. Um, so it's not... It's, it's really only talking about one very, very tiny part of the system, and it doesn't answer. People build amazing um, ML technologies all day, which just don't do anything useful. The question is, is it useful? Um, and just to reiterate, when we're doing this kind of analysis, what we're testing is the software. We cannot test the human part. Um, there's uh, and that isn't the function of computer science. We're not, we're not trying to measure people. Luckily, we can't erase people's memories and make the, do the same task a hundred times over to measure the, measure the different results. So what we're talking about is the accuracy of the machine, given the very, very carefully curated data that, that Tony's prepared. Um, so uh, with all those caveats, let's look at some results. So these are the um, precision and recall numbers for for Cipher for the um, uh, for the for the two tests that Tony created. These are averaged over 200 runs, which is typically how we do that when we're reporting precision and recall numbers. It's always over uh, at the very least dozens and more normally hundreds of thousands of runs to make sure that it's not some quirk of a system because the behaviour can vary quite differently depending on the slices. But these are the the mean results over that over that 200, uh, 200 runs. So that uh, kind of raises the question of why do we even bother? Um, what this work does is it proves that Cypher can understand, if you ignore the uh, anthropomorphization, uh, the subject of patents at least as well as humans can. Those, those numbers on the previous screen I would challenge anyone to go through that data without seeing Tony's labels and get the same sort of um, results. It's just very, very difficult to determine exactly what a patent's about. Repeat, beating those results manually would be extremely difficult. And this hopefully moves the debate away from uh, can machines classify patents, because clearly they can, even under these relatively difficult conditions, towards is it actually a worthwhile investment? Does the upfront investment of time and, and system costs to train classifiers worth the speed and repeatability benefits I get for deploying this, deploying this technology inside my company? Um, and with that, I'll hand back to Nigel. Um, 
before I go and move on to the general questions, there's one which has been asked already about this slide. I thought that might be. And the question is, what would be the implication if it had scored uh, 0.7? Um, well, I mean, it was just, just a different, um, it's just a different level of uh, system accuracy. The, I mean, there are plenty of classifiers out there that have 0.7 um, precision that people rely on every day. Uh, as, a, as a simple example, if you had a, a, a earthquake early warning system that had a precision of 0.5 and a recall of 0.9, that's still incredibly valuable. You'll get half of your alarms will be false positives, but you'll hardly ever be getting false alarms. And frankly, you'd rather have a 50% accurate warning and, and and have forewarning of earthquakes than not. So um, it, in and of themselves, the numbers don't really mean anything, but they do, they do prove this point that um, machines can judge the topic of a pattern given adequate training data. Look, and the, the questions are pouring in, so I want to move directly to them, but I did want to just end on this slide to go on. Obviously, the, the paper, the World Patent Information paper, uh, which you both authored, uh, was important from an algorithmic sense. There's been a lot of discussion in the industry about whether the world is ready for, uh, for ML, whether the patent world is ready for ML, and there's been some resistance and skepticism, and Tony, brace yourself, the first question is coming, coming for you. Uh, but but here's just some remarks of companies that have implemented ML algorithms, some of them cipher, there's some of them are not, and getting enormous value by saving cost, by saving time, by saving money without compromising, uh, without compromising accuracy. So I'm going to end the presentation uh, there and ask uh, our attractive speakers who have put shirts on specially for the day uh, to put cameras on. Uh, so, um, welcome, Tony, Steve. Uh, I, I told you, Tony, the first question is for you, and I'll, I'll read it out so I don't get it wrong. It said, um, your background has been in patent search for many years. What do you think the, impl uh, the, impl the impact of machine learning methods uh, will be on professional patent information specialists? Great. So, when I gave this presentation, uh, I was given the opportunity to, to the recent, the most past recent European Patent Office uh, Patent Information Conference. And, and, and part of that presentation was, was a bit of evangelization on, on my part, uh, which I have a tendency to do. And I mentioned when I first got into this industry, it was, it was primarily as a patent searcher, patent finder. Uh, but then it became very quickly apparent to me that, that there was uh, additional value, value, additional insight uh, there was additional work that I could be providing to the people that I, I was responsible for by doing analytics. And that was 20, 25 years ago that that movement began to, to pick up steam. And I would go to these conferences and talk to people, and they were mostly thinking that I was crazy, that that I was I was kind of off my rocker and, and uh, that that no, 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 no. You know, What's important is that that we're able to to identify good records for freedom to operate, and patentability, and for clearance and for validity and so on. And that's all again very 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 important. Uh, but it uh, became clear to me, and then it, it's borne out over time, that there was a bigger need. There were other clients. There were other uh, opportunities to add value to corporate decision making, other than just those. We are now in a similar situation. We are now in the exact same type of a environment where uh, analytics, classification, uh, 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 traditional sort of methods that are more or less uh, done by a brute force are being displaced by the opportunity to, to take advantage of computing power and machine learning and, and all of the rich work that's being done in the computer science area to provide even more insight and certainly efficiencies as far as time uh, for doing this work uh, by taking advantage of these items. And so the, the whole industry is going to be moving. It's going to become in 10 years from now, five years from now, uh, it, we're gonna wonder about why anybody ever did uh, just a Boolean search, for instance. 
Uh, it's still a little ways coming. There's still some some need for for transparency in some of these systems. There needs to be some education on the part of the practitioners, but there's no doubt about it that this change is coming, and and it's going to be a change that that is going to impact everybody, the clients, the vendors, the professionals. Uh, everybody is going to have to learn and and become more comfortable with working in this sort of environment. If I can just pick up on that, so this is my question to you, Steve. If if it's so important that the the IP industry, uh, of which I've been part for 30 years, engages with ML, why is it taken until now for these type of algorithms to be deployed commercially? Um, well, there were some major scientific advances kind of maybe seven, eight years ago, um, which resulted in both massively improved capabilities so the ability to learn from smaller data sets more quickly and massively more cheaply and to apply this technology over very large data sets you know we can classify 30 million patents in three quarters of an hour which um <laughs> the last ml systems i was working in academia would have taken months to do that same task and it would have cost half a million dollars it was just completely unaffordable so it's really about the advances in technology, hardware, all the discoveries around using graphics cards to accelerate AI algorithms have made just phenomenal difference. And, and of course, in, in many ways, this talk has been focused on ML for classification, but I know your interest in searching and finding, if I can use that term, Tony, goes much wider. What would you like to see developed in terms of machine uh, machine learning methods more generally going forward? So I, I had an opportunity uh, not so long ago to take a look at the entire process of building uh, a patent landscape report, for instance. And, and, and what I tasked myself with is, is each step along the way, where is it that I could uh, use machine learning methods uh, to improve and, and make that task more efficient or at least to augment what I was doing now. And so uh, if people are interested and they'd like to see a copy of those slides, I can certainly make that available. But but the bottom line was just along the entire continuum, you, you start with retrieval. Obviously there's opportunities for retrieval, increasing uh, the, the, the recall at, at the very least, uh, dealing with precision in some cases uh, that, that can take advantage of these methods. Data cleanup. Uh, the, the, it's a tremendous amount of opportunity. There's a great opportunity to do that because it takes a tremendous amount of time today to clean all of these things up, uh, to put everything in right order. And then of course the standardization, which is what we're talking about here, uh, also with regards to classification, uh, that, that, that any good landscape, you need at least three to five items to compare things with. And so like in the quantum computing space, there was qubit generation, versus other hardware aspects versus software versus applications like cryptography all right so those once you start to build those classifications then you can say okay well if i look at d-wave d-wave is great in almost all of them meanwhile ibm sort of similar but then you look at say a Rigetti, which is a new and up and coming company in the quantum computing space and they really only focus on one of those five items and, and so being able to then track those classifications over time as well. And, and then you even then get into the, the way the visualizations are done. Spatial concept maps uh, are just, they're, they're an unsupervised learning method. It's uh, that's referred to as clustering. In that case, k-means clustering, generally speaking, and it's unsupervised. And so there's a clear distinction between supervised and unsupervised methods. But these met and, and network citation diagrams, again, a, a network diagram is, is another means of, of using uh, various algorithms and various uh, techniques uh, to, to, to gain insight by uh, creating new and 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 um, powerful visualizations uh, that can provide additional key insights. And Steve, there's a question here which I think refers to your slide where you had humans sitting on top of the machine, where you analyze the human part of training and the machine part of classifying. Could you just explain, it says, explain supervised machine learning and where the human input is involved 
Yeah, so um, it's it, the process is called labeling, but it's basically going through a number of examples and tagging them with, in this case, whether they're positive or negative. Um, so um, it, depending on the kind of ML system you've got, it happens at different levels. So for example, the ML systems which do clinical diagnosis are trained on historical um, examples of microscope slides where they're, they're known to be cancerous or non-cancerous, for example, and they'll have a few thousand examples from, from labs across the world, and they're, they're used as the training examples. Um, in the patent case, we have way, 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 way more use cases, so we're building training sets that the labeled data on the fly, typically based on customer demand, so a customer phones up and says, I want uh, to be able to do a landscape on LiDAR technologies. Can you train me classifiers on LiDAR mirrors, lasers, sensors, motors, and so on? Um, and, and that's being done on demand in consultation with the end user. So they'll say, here's the scope, you know, like um, Tony showed his scope for the qubit generation of including these things, excluding these things. And the person that's doing the training interprets that scope and identifies some key number of uh, patterns which relate to that and some things which are um, in adjacent technologies and that's how the the classifier is trained does that does that answer the question um i'll, I'll watch the question channel but let's go and throw it immediately back to to tony does that change the role of a of a pattern searcher or does does it eliminate the uh, the, the role of a patent searcher? Does the profession feel threatened by these advances? Uh, I'm only a single representative and on the, on the lunatic fringe uh, by most people's accounts anyways. Uh, but no, um, I think there's, there's getting to be a, a more or less uh, general understanding that, that um, just from a capacity standpoint, I mean, you can ask the question, for instance, it, was end user searching? Uh, which became popular again maybe about 20 years ago. Was that going to displace the patent information professional? And, and the answer was no. Uh, it, it meant some 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 reevaluation. It meant some some evolution of what the profession was was responsible for. But it certainly didn't replace uh, because once again, in, in the case of say end user searching, there was a time and a place. Uh, there were questions that just weren't getting answered because. There wasn't a capacity. There wasn't there wasn't enough people to do the work, um, and so that just means you you have different priorities, uh, and so the priority gets to be more of like well okay well I can now focus my attention on uh, providing more insight, not just providing references, but what those references mean, and 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 talk more about what the business should be doing based on what it is that we've learned from asking these types of questions. Uh, and in addition, again, just from a throughput perspective, um, it's just a lot more that can, that can be done. And then finally, uh, just like we've talked about in this relationship here in building these collections, this is a specialized skill set. Working with patent information uh, is a specialized skill. Um, it's not the same as other data, pieces of data, data sources. So having people who understand it, work with it uh, and then can 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 weigh in and and lead guide uh, the the training efforts and and, and the development uh, of some of these things is, is essential and so no it's certainly not an elimination uh, but perhaps an evolution and I'll probably add my own personal spin to that uh, uh, many of the people on this call know that I used to be a, a lawyer and one of my um, special skills was doing due diligence on major m a and uh, it was crazy work for people spending times in rooms. In those days, data rooms were physical. And I remember in 2015 or 16, Forbes, uh, um, by the way, big plug for Tony, who's now writing a weekly bulletin for Forbes. But Forbes wrote up the ARM SoftBank transaction that talked about taking weeks of manual work out of the process and saving, therefore, time and money. Um, and I got asked a question at a conference saying, how, how did I feel? How did I sleep at night that I was destroying lawyers' jobs? Well, there was no part of the legal profession that I joined that thought I was qualifying to put 
patents into piles and date stamp them and check renewal fees and tag them and sort them. So I think there's a balance in all these uh, exercises between inspiration and perspiration. And no one uh, uh, makes money in the long term from perspiration, but by, by the, value, the added value on top. Now, a quick warning, uh, five minute warning for those people uh, uh, on the call. And I'm delighted to see that over 95% of people who signed up at the beginning have stayed on throughout. So I'm delighted to see that we haven't lost you, but there's five more minutes. Uh, so I know Steve and Tony will be willing to take a couple more questions. Uh, there's one more here. Uh, which I think is slightly provocative, Steve. So I'll let you take it first and then maybe pass it to Tony. Is this the end of Boolean search? No, I mean, <laughs> of course not. The, um, it, it's, a, it's a very different thing. Um, the, I mean, you, <laughs> as a trivial thing, we still use Boolean search when we're training classifiers because we've got to find the patterns in the first place before the machines had a chance to look at them. But um, Boolean search that does it has a specific role. It does a specific thing, and classifiers do something completely different. Like the, the purpose of a classifier is that you can get generate your landscape of lidar patterns or whatever it is, and not have to go through it manually. As long as you've trained the classifier well and you keep it up to date with movements in technology, you invest the effort up front in training the classifier, make it good. And then whenever you want to repeat that landscape, you just rerun it, cost you nothing, takes like an hour maybe, and you get the results back. Uh, that's a completely different value proposition to Boolean search. You wouldn't, you'd never use a classifier to find all the patterns in HO4R. It just wouldn't make sense. They've got, they're already tagged with that class code. So no. <laughs> Tony, do you want to take the the same question? I know you'll have a, a slightly different perspective on it. Yeah, okay, so Boolean sucks, okay? It, it's horrible. I, it, it's only used because once upon a time there was no other choice. And then it got romanticized to a certain degree, but it's horrible. I mean, I, I build collections for a living. That's, that's all I do. I've done thousands of them. Okay, and, and, and generally speaking, for every single one of them, there's a Boolean component. There's also a classification component. There's also a citation component. And more and more increasingly these days, there's a machine learning component. Now, if I took all of those, those uh, mechanisms and I put them all together to get my final recall, each and every one of them are finding unique references that were not available from any of the others. Okay, it's, it's just a simple fact. And on top of it, if I were then to look at precision, I would have to guess that it, 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 unless I'm just searching titles, my Boolean search is at best, at best, 50% precision, at best. It, 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 it's, it's, it's never, ever, I always have to do some sort of cleanup, always. There always has to be some sort of review, all right? So that in and of itself. Now, and plus on top of it, as far as a recall perspective is concerned, we write these enormous hedges and I do it too. So don't get me wrong. I've got scads of them, notebooks filled with, with synonyms and alternate phrases and different ways to put words together in order to find things. And so uh, that inherently becomes less precise just because of the nuances of just the English language, for instance. And so th th there should be no over romanization of boolean it's nothing special um it's a means to an end and used in combination with a variety of other methods and immediately has to be validated has to be reviewed in some fashion so no i, I i'm not going to miss the day when i have to or together 15 items and then put a near five uh, between another list of 15 items and then or that together with another list of 170 items and yada, 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 blah, 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 nested Boolean, this and that. So no, I'm not gonna miss that at all. Well, look, we, we've covered a, a broad range of topics from the why um, we think it's important that algorithms to be should be tested to the open access paper that you guys uh, um, ha have written, which uh, for those people who want to uh, read in more detail, it is available from the World Patent Information site for at no cost. 
for those people who are developing ML algorithms, and I know there are people on the call whose business it is, not necessarily in the same area as Cypher, but are working on it. If the gold standard collections which uh, Tony has put together are useful, please, um, please do download them. Please test your algorithms against them. We would love to hear your results. Um, don't, for those people who are, are users, we have some customers on the line. We are people who are looking at ML solutions. For those people uh, uh, who are, are doing that, remember that the paper will only answer one element of the trust and really ask Steve's question about, um, about what are you trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve? But in the, in the few minutes remaining, Tony, Steve, starting with you, Tony, what, what, what takeaways would you add to the pile for those people who have listened patiently and uh, devotedly for the last hour of debate? So you're taking, an op you're taking a chance to, to learn something new. All of us are getting into an area of discomfort and an area that, that of unfamiliarity. And, and that sometimes can, we can be reticent to do that. And we give ourselves a variety of reasons why we don't. Uh, most of which is, well, I, I'm just too busy right now and I don't have the time. And, and again, uh, one of the things I want to reiterate is, is that I think it's pretty essential that we do find the time, uh, each and every one of us. I think that there's, there's too much opportunity here uh, to, to simply say, well, you know what, I'll, I'll get to it. Or maybe at some point when I don't really have any other choice or my boss has explicitly come and told me that, hey, we really need you to do this, be proactive. Uh, get involved early, uh, learn a little bit about what's going on here, talk to folks, and and uh, educate yourself as to how to uh, feel comfortable uh, working uh, with some of these systems and and, and uh, taking advantage of the, the opportunities they provide. And Steve, unusually, the final word is with you. <laughs> um, so I think the, the key thing is it's not ML technology is everywhere. Like people, people use it on their phones, like every, every time they pick up their phone without without realizing it. And uh, the applications in the patent space are relatively new, but there's nothing uh, exotic and weird about patents. They're they're just they're just documents, and it's 100% amenable to, to ML algorithms. And um, and we we proved with this paper that um, algorithms can accurately identify the topic of patents and uh, people should be looking to exploit that capability to, to, to produce better results quicker and more reliably. Look, this has been a, a most enjoyable conversation. Tony, thank you for both the work you put into building the gold standard and for joining us today. Steve, that was a, another, I learned something every time I hear the explanation of ML. Uh, from me, Nigel Schweitzer, Tony Trippi, Steve Harris, thank you much, very much for joining. Uh, and you will be sent the recording immediately after the school, but tomorrow at the latest. Thank you very much.